Hi guys, Mr. Berry here. Um, I'm absent today because I am out taking a test, um, but I have pre-recorded what you are going to learn and we are going to just keep on doing exactly what we're doing as if I were here because I am electronically here. Um, so we are still talking about all the characteristics of life, but first of all, I just want to go ahead and say, in case it hasn't been said, um, the animals are a no-go today. They are only allowed out when I'm here. So don't go near the animals, don't touch them, don't open their cages, don't ask for animal time. Um, there'll be plenty of animal time when I'm back just today. I ask that you please leave them alone. They are off limits. Um, and you do have homework tonight. Please don't forget. So if you are sitting there right now like, oh gosh, I didn't know I had homework take a look at the board. Um, you will notice that you do have homework tonight and tomorrow night. So, uh, what we have been learning about yesterday and what we're going to learn about today are the characteristics of living things. And I'm going to keep explaining some of these characteristics. We um, started talking about some of these, but not all classes got there. So if you did it, this is going to be a little bit of a refresher. But go ahead and take out your notes. We are going to take some notes. Just a quick reminder that these are online on my website. If you go to the school's website and you find my name, you will find um, your class. Underneath my science classes, you'll have to choose from three of them, so figure out which one you're in. Find other resources. This will be posted there under what is life. That is kind of the unit we're on right now. So, we started talking about these six characteristics. And all of living things have to do all six of these, otherwise we don't consider them living. So. They all have to be organized into cells. They all have to use energy. They all need to grow and develop. They all respond to their environment. They all reproduce in some way, and they all maintain homeostasis. So we're gonna get into some more detail. So, organized into cells. Anything that is organized into cells that is living, we call an organism. So if it meets these six requirements, it is an organism. I'm an organism, you're an organism, Everything that is living is an organism. Ants, birds, bees, dogs, cats, mushrooms, flowers, bacteria are all organisms. And they're all made up of cells. Now, a cell is the smallest unit of life, that, the smallest unit of life, basically. There, yes, there are things smaller, and some of you yesterday told me, well, Mr. Mary, atoms are smaller. Yes, they are. They are smaller, but atoms aren't living. The smallest unit of life, the smallest thing that we can consider alive, is a cell. Because it's the smallest thing that can do all six of these. So, some animals are what we call unicellular. Uni means one. They have one cell. That is, their entire body is one cell. So, we can't really see these unicellular organisms, but I guarantee you they're everywhere. And most of them are bacteria. So there's bacteria literally everywhere. They're just crawling all over my body, crawling all over your body, crawling all over this board and every surface. Bacteria are everywhere. Um, those are our unicellular organisms, and there are more of them than there are of us, because we are the multicellular organisms. And although we are more conspicuous, that is, we are more easily spotted, um, there are really more of them. But here we are, we are multicellular organisms. That means that there are multiple cells. We have actually trillions of cells. The second thing that all organisms have to do is grow and develop. And grow just means it gets bigger. You guys know, obviously humans grow. You weren't born the size you are now. Development talks about the regular changes that happen in an organism's lifetime. Every organism goes through development, uh, whether it be a tree, or a squirrel, or a dog, or a human, we all go through development. Frogs have a really obvious development because they change so um, so obviously. There, it's obvious. It's very apparent that this does not look like it used to as a tadpole, and tadpoles do not look like eggs. Um, other animals, it's not as apparent in, such as snakes, because some people say, "Well, snakes look like snakes. You know, they come out of the egg." And they <laughs> Excuse me, that's my phone. I am recording this on my phone. Um, so, all animals develop though, regardless of whether they look very similar or not. They are changing and they are going through some changes that make them go from their immature form to their mature form. 
All animals have to, or not all animals, all organisms have to reproduce. All animals do too. We're organisms. But all organisms, everything that lives, has to make more of itself somehow. Otherwise, the whole species dies. So that's where reproduction comes in. And I don't want you to think of reproduction like you think of human reproduction. I want you to think of reproduction in, in a very broad way. That is, reproduction is the process by which one organism makes another organism. So sometimes that does mean what you're typically thinking of with the male and the female. And ah! the Again, I'm sorry. Um, but a lot of times this can happen through really weird ways. With bacteria, they divide. So you have one bacteria and they split into two. Um, sometimes you can have things called, or something like budding, where one organism kind of grows this outgrowth of itself that breaks off and becomes a whole new organism. Um, there's lots of different ways that organisms reproduce. The important part is all of them do it. All right, number four, all organisms respond to their environment. Things in our environment that um, change are called stimuli. Anything in our environment that we can react to is a stimulus. Stimulus is one, stimuli is plural. So for example, if you are in class, I bet you could think of a lot of stimuli, things that could catch your attention or things that you respond to. Things like the temperature and the amount of light are stimuli. But so is somebody tapping a pencil on your desk or somebody, you know, banging their, their hand on the table constantly. All of those things that you could respond to are stimuli and it's limitless how many stimuli you interact with and deal with every single day. We divide them because there is so many, we divide them into two categories. So we have internal stimuli, which are things that change within you. So for example, your own temperature is an internal stimuli. If you start running a fever, um, that's a change and you're gonna react to that change. But that's internal, that's in your body. And that's not gonna really affect a lot of other organisms directly. External stimuli are changes outside of the organism. So the weather is an external stimuli that changes and we react to it. Um, the exterior temperature, not your body temperature, but the temperature of the air around you. Um, other animals, um, in, in your case, other people that you interact with, are external stimuli. Really, everything around you is a stimulus. But our ability and an organism's ability to respond to this is what makes it, gives it that characteristic of living. Because if we look at a rock, a rock does not respond to anything in its environment. It doesn't matter what happens to the rock. It doesn't respond. And you may be thinking, well, I don't understand how, you know, a plant responds to its environment. And sure, it doesn't respond like we do. It's not going to say something or get up and walk away. It's a plant, but it does respond. So when you don't water a plant and it doesn't have enough water, that is definitely an external stimuli, a lack of water. It's very dry. The plant wilts. It is responding to what's going on in its environment. So you can't always think about how you respond to things. You have to think about it much, much more broadly. All right. Homeostasis. This is the word that really confused some of you when I introduced it to you. And this is what it means. This is the definition. This is an organism's ability to maintain steady internal conditions when outside conditions change. So no matter what's going, around, going on around your body, no matter what the temperature is outside, no matter how wet it is, how cold it is, um, your internal body maintains, your body maintains about the same internal conditions. Um, so it keeps a regular environment on the inside, which is incredibly important so we can keep functioning. If it didn't, we would die. Um, if you walked outside when it was 30 degrees and your body couldn't maintain your own temperature, you would freeze. So I have a short brain pop video to show you. I don't really know how well this is going to work since I'm recording this with my phone, but we'll find out.
And please, if you have not written down that definition, write it down. This is one of those hint, hint, wink, wink moments. doesn't appear to be working correctly, so I've had to find the brain pop through other means. It doesn't look exactly like it normally does, but that's okay, because we can still watch it. So, it's a little grainy, but you'll get the idea. Damn, it's having Obi. Ryan's homeostasis. Run or dead? That's a great question, Odette. We all know that the conditions in the outside world change all the time. Hmm. Huh. But things are different inside your body. The conditions in there don't really change at all. In most circumstances, our bodies remain at a constant temperature. That's because humans are warm blooded animals, just like cats and dogs and camels. <laughs> Ew. Cold blooded animals, like lizards and fish, depend on their environment to regulate their body temperature. Anyway, the temperature and the chemical balance inside your body have to stay the same for you to function. To maintain this sameness, which is called homeostasis, your body regulates itself in a bunch of ways. Thermoregulation is the way your body keeps its temperature steady at around 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, no matter how hot or cold it is outside. Here's how it works. The hypothalamus is a part of your brain that acts as a sort of a thermostat. When your body temperature starts to rise or fall, a special team of nerves and hormones called a feedback system sends a warning to the hypothalamus. We only need this, this thing to show how feedback works. When the water level gets too high, he opens the valve at the bottom to let some out. 
if there's too much water, to add more to keep the water at just the right level. The feedback systems in your body behave in much the same way. Most feedback is negative, meaning that the change is bad news and needs to be countered. In thermal regulation, it's negative feedback that tells the hypothalamus when you're overheated and you need to sweat, or that you're really cold and you may need to shiver in order to generate heat. Feedback can be positive, too, meaning that the change in your body is a good thing and should even be increased for a while. When a pregnant woman goes into labor, it's positive feedback controlling the contractions that push the baby out. Another part of the hypothalamus's job is to make you run a fever when you're sick. At those times, the thermostat resets itself to a higher temperature to give your body more heat energy to fight infection. But homeostasis isn't just about regulating body temperature. For example, your excretory organs get rid of chemical waste that's poisonous to your body. A part of your brain called the respiratory center makes sure that you have the right oxygen and carbon dioxide mix in your blood at all times. And your immune system defends you from invading viruses, bacteria, and allergens that don't belong in your body. Homeostasis ensures that the environment inside your body remains stable, no matter how crazy the outside world gets. No, I'm not going to feel your forehead. Because you don't have a fever. Well, you're not warm blooded. You don't have blood. Oh, you forgot to turn that water thing off. You just exist to get me in trouble, don't you?
just to review. And you might want to write these questions down. Not saying you'll see them again, but I'm not saying you won't. What is the term we use to describe a living thing? So write down your answer. We're going to go back through for the answers. All right, a living thing. What do we call it? What does homeostasis mean? What does that mean? You can put this in your own words. It doesn't have to be a super lengthy description. A few words will work. smallest unit of life? What is the absolute smallest thing that we can consider a living thing? And finally, where does most of the energy that organisms use ultimately come from? Where is the ultimate source of all of the energy that we use every day? Unicellular organism. Are you and I unicellular? to describe a living thing. I hope you wrote down organism. No matter how big or how small, if it's alive, we call it an organism. And that is how you spell it. What does homeostasis mean? Well, to put it simply, it means Maintaining a constant internal environment. So, this is your body's ability to make sure what's on the inside stays constant. Doesn't change every time you walk into a new room that's colder or hotter or whatever. Alright, what is the smallest unit of life? Hopefully, you wrote down a cell. That's the smallest thing that we can consider living on its own. Yeah, there are things smaller than cells, but we don't consider them living. So the smallest thing that can possibly be alive is one single cell. Where does most of the energy organisms use ultimately come from? today ultimately got its energy from the sun. Even if you ate a burger, you can trace every part of your burger back to the sun. And finally, what is a unicellular organism? Well, remember, uni means one. So it is a one-celled organism, a single-celled organism. So are humans unicellular? No. No, we are not. We obviously have more than one cell. We are much larger than a single cell, which makes us multicellular. Multi means many. We have many, many cells. Trillions of cells, in fact. That's a lot of cells. So we are definitely not unicellular. So today what you're going to be doing for the rest of class is making a foldable to help you guys remember these six characteristics because I will ask you for them, I will ask you for all of them, 
and I will expect you to know what they mean. So, what you're going to do is make a six, six tabbed foldable. And I'll show you an example in a second. You're going to write on each tab one characteristic of life. So, you know all six now, you're going to write one on each, and then you're going to turn the flap up, and on the other side, write what that means, write an example, and please do neat work. I will collect these, and they will be a grade, and I will expect them to be neat and make sense, because these are not just for me, but they're also for you. So. As an example, and I don't actually know how close I am, um, sorry if I'm really close. So you should write the six characteristics on each one of your tabs. If you take your three sheets of paper that the sub will give you and you line them up like so, like you have a little bit of space between each one, fold it over, voila, you will get six tabs. So on each one of these tabs, write a characteristic. You have plenty of markers, you have colored pencils, you have lots of materials to help you. And the sub is also going to pass out a class set of a page out of your book. Now I don't have a class set of books, so I copied this page for you. It is in your book at home if you'd like to reference it. Please do not write on this page. Do not take it with you. The sub will need these pages for the rest of the day. So every other class is going to use these. On one side of this paper, there is a chart that shows these very same six characteristics. You are more than welcome to use this chart to help you with this assignment. Remember, you have to tell me what it means and write examples of what, what happens. So for example, for homeostasis, we might talk about thermoregulation or maintaining a temperature. So humans are normally 97.8 degrees or somewhere around there. So that could be an example for homeostasis. Now, um, on the other side of that sheet the sub is going to give you is your homework for tonight. If you finish this and you have time, you may start on your homework. It is page 16, 1 through 11, all 11 questions on that page. So there should be no excuse for anybody to have anything not to do. If for some reason you can do all of that, then find some other homework to do. I know you have math homework or you can do your current event for the week. Do something. I do not want to come back to a report that you guys were not doing your work or were goofing off because there should be no excuse to not have something to do. If you do not finish this, take it home because you have a book at home that you can finish this with. So have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful class. I will see you tomorrow.